Well, thank you, Daniel, for that great introduction. And I might have some hints in my presentation why I didn't fly in today, but that that might happen sooner than a lot of people in the audience may think. My name is Olaf Otto. I am working for Siemens the Aircraft, and for the past three years, I've had the privilege of working for what I think is one of the most exciting technological revolutions currently ongoing. And it has the potential to change not only the way that we travel and commute, but also the way that we transport goods or even build out transportation infrastructure like roads, trains, and airports. So let me tell you a little bit about this change that is just around the corner for aviation. Now, flying is something that is decidedly mass market already. Um, actually, let's do a little exercise, um, and I'll get you to, if I can get you to stand up, and maybe we can have a little bit of light so I can see what's going on in the room. If everybody could stand up, get you some exercise, get some air into those lungs. Now, if everybody, everybody who has never in his or her life flown, you guys can sit down. All right. That's about, about everybody. So now let's take this one step further. Everybody who is a frequent flyer who flies maybe eight to ten times a year. You guys stay standing, everybody else sit down. All right. So I'll do a quick visual integral. I would say that's about 20% of the audience. So 20% of the audience fly relatively regularly. So let's pick this up one notch further with a final question. All of you who use planes as a regular way to commute, you guys stay standing and everybody else sit down. All right, so I would say within the margin of error, that's nearly zero, sir. I'd like to speak to you later. That sounds fantastic. We've got one person who's a regular commuter on planes. So why is there that big drop-off? Why don't we all use planes as we use cars, for example? Well, you're going to say, Olaf, that's kind of obvious. It's a question of cost. It's quite expensive to fly. If you want to rent a small plane, that costs you upwards of 100 euros an hour. Um, planes are polluting. They have CO2, they have nitrous oxides, and they're very noisy. Nobody wants to have an airport in their backyard. And finally, it's a question of utility. It takes a long time to get to an airport. There's check-in times, there's check-out times. So all of those things make it difficult to have aviation as a real mass market and, and mass way of transporting. But what if you could remove those obstacles one by one? I would argue that that would open out aviation to a completely new form of transport for all of us. And that's actually what has gotten me out of bed for the last three years. Um, basically, the question uh, and the belief that aviation should be something that is efficient, individualized, quiet, emission-free, affordable, and easy. And we believe that that change can be done, that we can move to, a a to, a, to an aviation of that form by going to hybrid electric propulsion for planes. So how would that help us address the constraints from earlier, the question of cost, pollution, and utility? Well. One of the key topics is the separation of power generation and thrust generation. Let me explain that a little bit to you. So here's an airplane that I drew earlier. And here's the propulsion system. And um, that's, by the way, is the reason why I didn't become an artist for a living. But what happens in an engine, and that's the red part on the screen, um, are basically two things. First, the engine uses fuel to change the fuel into mechanical power, it turns a shaft, so that's the power generation part. Then that shaft turns a propeller or uh, a fan, and that pushes air out, and that's the thrust generation. Now, what happens if I electrify this plane? If I electrify this plane, I can now separate power generation and thrust generation, and I get something that generates the thrust, the electrical motor, that it's quite light. And now what I can do is that I can put that motor wherever I like. So that offers a lot of design freedoms. I can put it at the wings to increase airflow over the wing for greater lift. I can put it at the tip of the wings to reduce drag from vortices, vortices that are being generated. I can put it in free stream propeller configurations. All these changes allow me to radically improve the efficiency of the airplane. 
I can also move to hybrid configurations. So here you see the power generation part of the engine being placed in the tail of the plane, being able to produce energy for the electrical propeller, and that means that I can run that power generation unit at an optimal point, again, being more efficient and um, leading, ultimately, then to lower operating cost. And these lower operating costs um, are something that has been quoted already today for planes that you can buy, and you can buy electrical planes today, you can put down orders for planes that are being built, and we're looking at operating costs to the order of a fifth, 20% of what you pay today. So that is already a radical change. So that covers one item, cost, pollution also. We have higher efficiencies, um, also leading to less pollution. If we have a fully electric plane, then provided you get your electricity from clean sources, um, also a very, very clean um, uh, proposal. Now that leaves one question on the pollution side, which is the question of noise. And there are three main sources of the noise. One is the engine. Um, now, again, if I electrify my plane, that falls away. The second is the propeller. Um, and the question of how noisy the propeller is is uh, very tightly correlated with the speed that the propeller turns at and the, and, and the shape of the propeller. And again, if I use electrical motors, I can make the propeller much more efficient um, and I can run the electrical motor at a much slower speed as well, much easier. Um, and that will bring down the noise of the plane significantly. The third big area of noise is airflow over the fuselage. And there again, by cleverly placing my propulsion, my, my thrust generation units, I can influence that noise level significantly. And this ability to play around and this ability to configure the system um, also influences the last one, one last area, which is one of utility. I can actually decide how I position my thrust generation. I can vector them, and now I can suddenly think about taking off vertically and landing vertically as well. So all these taken together um, actually lead us to possible designs which are individualized, which allow direct travel. You can take off and land closer to urban areas, potentially even within cities. And I've brought along one short video that we made. Um, so we are, we're building these propulsion units, and we ran a test on one of our test platforms um, comparing the combustion engine version with the electrified version. So keep in mind that this is not yet optimized for propeller noise. Um, it's not got any of the um, new layouts of the propulsion system, but I think you'll hear some of the difference already. So we'll see two videos, one on takeoff. So this is quite a large difference, as you, I hope, heard, and as you can also see. Um, and not only is the overall sound pressure reduced, but also those really annoying components, the grating noises, they fall away completely. So there you go. That is a, a, a glimpse of the direction that things are heading, but that's by no means where um, things will finish. Um, this video um, and, and the measurements we did show a reduction of some 14 decibels, but this is really only the beginning. There are several w efforts underway now globally to build airplanes which you won't be able to hear um, if you're standing 50 feet away. Um, here's one such concept, one, one such idea, and you can see that that already includes a lot of the um, concepts that I had on my sophisticated drawing earlier. So why is this happening now? Um, truth be told, we're seeing the effects of a journey that has already started a decade ago, and that's um, yielding results now. And 
The reason why we do it is because we've made advances in two areas. And one is power density and one is energy density. Power density is basically how much power you can get out of something per weight of that object. And energy density is how much energy you have something in terms of the weight that object has. And both those sides have made significant advantage. On the power density side, um, what you see on the left is a um, train motor. This is one of the best performing motors out there. And you see the power density, that's the number at the bottom that's below one. And on the right, you see one of the engines that we're building today to fly electrical planes. And those have power densities approaching six kilowatts per kilogram. So it's a factor of six better. So that gives you something very small, very light, that you can put wherever you need it. The second part of the equation is energy storage. This will take a little bit longer, and there's going to be lots of numbers on the screen. So all of you who are more visual, please bear with me. But this is important because there are lots of critics that say it will never work. Because simply put, batteries will never be as energy powerful as fossil fuels. So let's have a look at those numbers. So fossil fuels come in at about 12,000 and the unit is watt hours per kilogram. Forget the unit, 12,000. The best batteries that you have in cars today give you about 150. So there's a huge gap in between here. Engineers say these are two orders of magnitude. Two orders of magnitude is something that as an engineer I say, you know, let's not touch that, it's too difficult. But the problem is not actually as bad as that because fossil fuel burning engines are not completely efficient. They waste a lot of the energy that you put in. So what you actually have is you have about a third of the energy that you put in is actually comes out as usable energy. So that brings you down to about 4,000. And then we have all those benefits that you can achieve by utilizing the placement of the engines and everything that I talked about earlier. And that brings you down to below 3,000, give or take. So that's the one side. On the other side, we are flying with batteries today in our, um, in our test platforms that have 200 watt hours per kilogram. And we have um, roadmaps from suppliers and makers of batteries that point to well over 500 watt hours per kilogram. So now suddenly we're in an area where the factor is not 100, but the factor is only five or six. So that's something where you can actually do something. Where it's, you know, you, you'll be able to find meaningful applications. And actually, it's even a little bit better than that because, and I don't have an equation to show you, but from all the discussions that I've had, people that build airplanes, they will be very happy if we can give them something that sits above 300 watt hours per kilogram for a variety of reasons. And one main reason is cost because the electrons are going to be much cheaper than the fossil fuel you put in. And this is not also just theory. Um, I brought along a little graph that I made on the left. This is the number of electric or hybrid electric projects that have been publicly announced. And you can see that in the last couple of years, that number has just exploded. Everybody is building these things. And regulation is on our side. This is on the right-hand side. Flying is going to become much more expensive due to climate change, due to fossil, f fossil fuel reduction targets. How will it play out? This is one of our test platforms flying over the airport in Hungary. Um, you can buy these small planes already. Uh, about 100 have been sold last year. Um, this is a market that is ready for development. These fly for about an hour, an hour and a half today. Very exciting segment is the eVTOL air taxi segment. Um, this is something that every major company is working on. Um, you name them, um, Airbus, Boeing, Rolls-Royce, Bell. Um, what you see on the screen here is an air taxi that we're building together with Airbus. We provide the propulsion system, which is broken out on the right. Um, and that's something that we hope to see um, in action sometime throughout this year. The next area is the commuter class. And this concerns planes that have four to 19 seats. Um, on the screen here is an airplane from a company called Eviation. Again, we're providing the propulsion system for this one. And this you'll be able to see in real life at the Paris Air Show later this year. And this has the potential to really change together with the category that I showed you before, the face of transportation. Because any aircraft manufacturer today is producing 
production runs of tens, dozens, if they reach 100, it's been an amazing, never to be repeated year. What happens with these planes now? When we bring down the cost, when we bring down the pollution, when we bring down the noise, these are going to be produced and manufactured, not in the hundreds, but in the thousands and in the tens of thousands. And this is going to change the way that aviation works. This is going to change manufacturing. And what a lot of people don't realize, it's going to again impact the cost dramatically. Because today, due to the low numbers, there's a lot of manual labor involved. The automation level is minimal. But for these, you know, these kind of production runs, you're going to get into automotive style manufacturing. And this is going to even decrease the cost further. The last segment is the most complex. This, com uh, this comprises the planes that you know today as commercial transport planes that you fly on. There's a lot of research that still needs to be done to reach this size of plane. This is underway uh, in a number of different companies. Um, we are researching this as well. And here you have to look at very exciting and um, out-of-the-way technologies um, such as high-temperature superconducting. Um, and to get that on a plane will take some more years to come but uh, it's an exciting field of development. So I want to leave you with this last chart here. I drew this chart in 2016, and we basically pulled together all the research, every development roadmap that we knew, and we said, let's create something that's very high level, and let's put on the most important development points for the next 50 years, and what's going to happen. And within one year, um, it turned out that I drawn this chart wrong, and I had to change the number 2018 to 2017 for the market entry, because that's when the market entry happened. Now this year already, um, that second number, where it says 2022 market ramp up for certified systems, um, there are various companies that have come out and have boldly said that they aim to be in the market by 2021. So I'm very hopeful that I'm wrong on that number as well, and that that kind of wrongness will continue throughout the time. One thing um, I think is sure, we don't know what the winning concepts are going to look like yet. I don't think anybody has really built something that comprises of all the exciting things that can be done. But I think all of us um, have an exciting and uh, great future in store in aviation. Thank you. <laughs>